All right, day one of the Royal Symposium here in uh, Boca Raton. And if you don't know what this is or why I am here, who I am in the first place, which I, I wouldn't blame you for, but it just means that you haven't watched day zero, which was basically me ranting on whether it's worth coming all, uh, all the way out here to this conference, taking you all the way through the process, showing the conference floor, the venue, and all these all the good stuff. And also asking um, attendees if they thought it was worth coming and also asking them to grade the conference on a scale of 1 to 10. Or so I'm hoping so because technically those interviews are not recorded yet because this is day one and it's it, continuity purposes. You, uh, I don't have time to explain this because it's extremely hot. But anyways, um, and I am outside, unfortunately. Uh, point being, day one is going to be all about talking to the attending experts. I'm going to be asking them three questions, basically. What metal do you think is going to outperform over the next 12 months? What jurisdictions you like and what jurisdictions you hate? And number three, what three questions would you ask companies before deciding to invest in them or not? And I'm going to use those questions on day two where I'm going to go and be annoying to all or, well, as many of the companies that are attending as possible and ask them those three questions. Or so I hope, again, because I've scheduled zero interviews coming out here. So I actually hope to ambush them and make them want to talk to me, which I think is going to be a hard task. Um, Either way, that's going to be the plan for, and I'm going to publish that in a couple of days. So the plan for today is this, and then the plan for today, I told you what it is. And also, I really want to head inside now because it is 75 degrees outside, and that's Celsius. And it's, I guess that's three coconuts and seven snakes, or whatever people in Florida like to measure temperature in. Let's go inside and see if uh, anyone wants to talk to me. All right, Drake, if uh, we were talking here in 12 months, which I hope we're going to be, and you had to head out perform everyone else, what medal would you pick to outperform everyone else here? I understand the question. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think in 12-month terms. Uh, I think in three to five-year terms. And I don't think about what's hated, where you have momentum. Uh, or, pardon me, what's loved. Uh, I, I sort of think about what's hated. Sadly, almost nothing is hated right now. I think lithium will come to be hated two years from now. Uh, I think nickel will come to be hated two years from now. Uh, platinum and palladium will come to be hated uh, two years from now. If you ask about a category of stocks that I'm attracted to, I continue to be attracted to uh, two categories, uh, world-class deposits in commodities that are out of favor, things like Centaurus or Sovereign. Uh, and I'm attracted to the uranium development space for reasons that you and I have talked about online the fact that the term contracts allow deposits to be financed that couldn't otherwise be deposits, uh, pardon me, that couldn't otherwise be financed. But in terms of a metal that will perform over the next 12 months, I, I don't really know. Do you think we're ever going to see a, a bull run in lithium again in our lifetimes? There have been arguments that we might not. I do. I'm not sure we'll have a bull market in the material. But I think that we'll come to a place two years, two and a half years from now, where people will hate lithium with the intensity that they hated gold or that they hated silver as an example, or uranium in 2022. There's no hate that is sincere as the hate of a jilted lover. And lithium had so many lovers, disappointed so many people, that lithium will come to be regarded as a four letter word. We were never in short supply of lithium. What we had was a shortage of refining capacity. The demand outstripped it. We went to look for lithium, we found a lot. A lot of those deposits won't get built. But the high quality deposits will be thrown out by people who hate the substance. My suspicion is if you and I are talking, and I hope we will be in 2026, that lithium will enjoy the same disfavor that gold, the, pardon me, uranium enjoyed in 2022. And I'm hoping to be as bullish on lithium stocks then as I was on your show in 2022 with uranium stocks. Do you think uranium is going to go to that point, though, with the disgruntled lover thing? I don't. Uh, I, I think that the uranium market will bifurcate between real companies. I think there's 12 or 13 of them. And pretenders. Uh, I think there's 80. Uh, most of the investors, unfortunately, aren't educated enough or willing to work hard enough to differentiate uh, between the good and the bad. Uh, I think the people who hover around the good ones will make 30 or 35% compounded for five or six years, which is a very nice return. Unfortunately, the penny stock punters who go to the stories that just have uranium as a component of the name on the share certificate but no, have no actual uranium 
will suffer the fate they deserve. I am a big bull on so many of our commodities right now because um, as I've spoken here in my speech, which was called the Real Asset Big Bang, I think we're at a very transformative um, part of the energy cycle, the national security cycle, and the national sovereignty, sovereignty cycle. And everybody is in a supply chain war. That said, I see uranium as being the um, outperforming commodity if I'm just looking at a one-year horizon. I do see other commodities rising. I see gold rising, I see silver, I see copper, but I, I think uranium is going to outperform for a couple of reasons. One is at the moment that we're speaking, um, it's, it's off of its highs. Um, it is up 60% over the year. Um, it was double. Um, so it's trading in 80.85. It's been consolidating in that in that arena, but it has traded as high as 107. So I do see that upside be re being recovered after this period. Also, in the last few months, there have been a number of significant um, pieces of legislation that have been signed and passed by the United States government to do a number of different things, which all relate to needing more uranium supply domestically and from allies. That is something called the Advance Act, which um, invests in nuclear technology, which makes the use and the processing of uranium more efficient into small modular reactors, micromodular reactors, um, something called the Nuclear Fuel Security Act, which means that we as a country, the United States, wants to basically have its own sovereignty over uranium um, and the supply chain, um, and also the Russian, uh, ban Russian uranium bill. Um, and what that is is basically saying, again, more substantiating of our having our own uranium supply chains and through our allies. So I think that that as a commodity is going to be more in demand because it takes a minute for mines to operate, and so the existing mines are going to be overproducing into a supply requirement, into, I'm sorry, into more supply requirement, into more demand on that side. So, um, uranium. Uh, uranium. That's it? Why? <laughs> you said what most. Okay, uh, I'm going away. <laughs> well, it would have been different just a bit ago, but it's obviously the stocks, not the metal. We don't stuff uranium under our mattress. And it's not quite hated, but uranium has gotten boring again. The, you know, the opportunity set is there. Gold as of Friday's close was back up almost to 2,400. You know, I love gold this year. I think all the reasons I was bullish on it before are still ahead of us. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not in that phase where people are getting sick of it the way that it is with uranium. So opportunities in uranium stocks. Okay. One of your competitors in a newsletter writing space said copper, and I kind of disagreed, pushed back a little bit on mm, 12 months. Like I can see yes. it in five years. Yes. No, I, I would absolutely agree with that. I'm, of all the long-term theses out there, copper is hands down the best. There, there's, there's not enough, there's no substitute. Sorry, aluminum isn't gonna do it. it, it it's, and these big copper mines are getting almost impossible to permit. This is, uh, you know, but 12 months, that's trickier. Now, and he may be right or she. Um, if I'm right about the hard landing and that creates an instant pivot by the powers that be and the, and the easy money floodgates open again, that could happen within 12 months. Mm -hmm. So, and, the, and then the, that I think would be very bullish for copper strength. But it's, but you just never know when these things are gonna work out. So it's very hard for me to say that. I'm chomping at the bit. I'm waiting to be able to say copper. Okay. I do want to go to the macro here in a second, but I want to go back to what you just said about uranium is that we well, cannot stuff it in, you know, under your mattress. Mr. Sprock can do it, or well, his product company. Why not that? Well, if you're risk averse and you want, you know, uh, just to have exposure to the metal itself without exposing yourself to the metal itself, then sure, why not? But most of us are speculators looking for more alpha, and for that, you need the stocks. For me, I'm not trying to beat everybody else, right? And I think this is a really important thing to understand. I'm not in this to try and beat everybody else. And I think if that's your if that's your motivation, then you're a very certain type of investor. For me, in the metals world, I want to own gold because I want my purchasing power to be preserved. And I think more and more in this, in this next 12 months, that purchasing power is going to come under attack in the fiat world. Mm. So for me, I'm not looking to outpace everybody. I'm looking for my purchasing power to remain strong. And I think gold will do that over 12 months, 24 months. It's done it for me over 21 years. So that, that's my answer. Hang on, you, you said something that I kind of felt seen in. You said if you're trying to outperform other people, then you're a certain type of investor, and I kind of yeah. like, I felt that. What kind of investor do you think tries to outperform other people? Well, look, I think, I think if, if, you, if you go into, if you're investing capital, mm -hmm. right, the idea is to get the best returns you can. If, you're, if you have one eye on what everybody else is doing, that's, I think, that's a critical mistake to make. Because it's going to it's going to make you do things. If you see the guy next to you is up 
12 percent you're only up 10 and your goal is to beat him you're going to start making decisions that aren't necessarily the right ones for your portfolio that's to try and catch up and i just think that's crazy and you know, this is not this is not um a competitive environment this is this is very personal and you're either an investor or you're a speculator and you better understand that which is what my talk's going to be about tomorrow what are you um and once you understand that it's very personal. It doesn't matter what anybody else is doing. It's all about you and making sure that you invest along the lines that give you the best chance to make returns. Well, so let's just, one important thing people miss is Berkshire Hathaway is 19% cash, 18% cash or something of their total assets. And they have those in 13-week T-bills. And that tells you something because that's a 5% return that's risk-free. And I mean, it really is risk-free. Like even if the government has to print the money, they're going to give you that money back. So it's like, you know, you're going to make 5%. Well, most of the mining stocks are actually down in the highest gold market of all time. Now, what's interesting to me is, is that the copper market obviously is up a bit, right? But like the stocks aren't following. Okay. The silver market is back to where it was in late 2011 or something like Q4. It was like 30, 32 bucks or something. So it's kind of back there. Gold's at all time highs. I mean, gold's the leader. That's it. Yeah. Gold's the one. Gold, don't overthink it. Gold's yeah. the one. You know, the, the other markets have different complexities. They have different things. No central bank is storing copper, you know, as a primary means of, of, of holding reserves. You know, and the world knows that there's a trouble, there's trouble. And the, the long-term trajectory for debt is up. The trajectory for, you know, for currency and circulation is up. And, and I think that's why you're seeing central banks are buying and average people are selling. Yeah. What does that tell you? Oh, I mean, in my world, it's silver, unquestionably. It's been the best performing metal since the beginning of the year, up over 40%, at least in terms of precious metals. And I think it will be the best performing metal moving forward, even with its 40% increase since January on many levels, uh, you know, whether you're talking geologically or historically in its relationship to gold, it's an anomaly. It's massively, massively undervalued. And um, the, the uses are expanding so dramatically at the same time the, the footprint geologically is decreasing. I don't think you could ask for a, a better setup, a better story, and if I had to guess, a better performing asset than silver. So nothing else like anything like copper, uranium, or anything crazy like that? You know, those all have their place. But to me, it's the monetary side of silver, not to mention its duality in demand. So a metal like uranium does not have duality. It's used in, in its energy production, I suppose you could say militarily. But when we talk about silver, not only does it have a monetary aspect, which has really kind of been revitalized and, and experienced a renaissance over the last few years, but the demand for it in green and digital and military applications, giving it really a whole set of, of applications that really aren't related, give it tremendous potential. So while those may do well, to me, I'm focusing on the monetary aspects of, of these metals in addition to the industrial side. And I think there's a very compelling argument in, in all of those statements. So yeah, to me, silver is, is definitely the horse to pick. Oh, well, co go gold would be my top pick. And that's because of a risk and a reward. I mean, a reward and a risk. If I was only looking at reward, it would probably be silver. Mm. But, but gold for risk reward. Everyone's told me pretty much the same thing. If that was not an option, what would you pick? <laughs> well, copper would be next, for sure. Okay. For 12 months, though, um, you're not but, scared? But, but I was going to say, 12 months is a little short for copper. Okay. If, if you ask me three or five years, I'd say copper, no question. Okay. Um, but there aren't too many, yeah, yeah. Yeah. One of, you, one of, your, uh, one of your neighbors, Lobo Tigre, he's told me uranium. Yes. Well, he's a uranium um, expert. He knows a lot about uranium. I don't pretend to know a lot about it, and I do defer to him. We own a lot of we own a lot of uranium, but again, for me, uranium is more of a three to five year story, which may or may not happen in the next twelve months. Um, there's been a lot of commodities here, so of all the choices, maybe I should clarify them as well. For that, I don't know how many people, but you've had lithium for batteries, you've got copper. You've had uranium, which has already begun moving and moved quite a bit. And then you have the two precious metals that are the common one, gold and silver. Out of that category, I am very debt collapse focused. I think we're facing and we're in the process of a debt collapse. So that is monetary failure. And as a result, my hotspot is the monetary metals, which is gold and silver. 
first gold and then I roll into the silver is my positioning. When you say dead collapse, are you thinking the next 12 months? Like, are we going to see a black swan event in the next 12 months? It's not a single event, it's a process. So we've already begun that process and we're part way through it, but it's going to have a Lehman's moment of uncontrolled or disorderly markets. And the only place that's going to be well served in that uh, circumstances for me is the monetized precious metals, real money. What, what happens to the other metals, the other commodities that you just mentioned in the meantime? So uh, the problem with copper uh, in that scenario, by the way, I'm bullish all the things I mentioned. I'm just more bullish certain things. Some of those things are required or based on economic activity. Mm -hmm. And if we are doing the debt collapse, there's going to be a dearth of economic uh, activities. You have to feel the CV19 events, March 20, uh, everything got switched off, that nothing happens for a while. And there's that problem, that massive reaction. And then hold on, it takes a while for the solution to arrive. That's not good for economic activity. People aren't doing buildings or buildings stop. Copper stands and waits, mines don't operate. That's not a good environment um, for economic activity and productivity. So what we then have is a panic. Uh, and in fact, everybody's looking for what's real money. That's uh, where gold and silver will shine in a relative basis to lithium, uranium, and all the other things. I have been consistently uh, harping on copper and uh, continue to do so. 12 months though, I mean, with the economy and everything going? Yes, the problem really is I'm not looking at the demand side as much as the supply side, that we're seeing a lot of constraints, we're seeing projects that are getting deferred, uh, we're seeing uh, political issues that are stopping exploration and development in a lot of jurisdictions. So copper is definitely one that I keep my eye on. Yeah. Do you think that 12 months is going to be enough, though, to, for, for that story to play out? Because I kind of feel like maybe that's a 10-year thing that you're talking about. Yeah, it, but the thing is that we anticipate. When, we, when we're talking about what's going to happen in a year is that they're thinking two or three years ahead. And that shortfall gets closer and closer right. in terms of the production gap. I think copper and I think rare earths. Okay. And I got to say gold. I, I'm, I, I like gold. Okay. Why copper for the next 12 months, though? I mean, the global macro still seems challenging from a recession perspective. Copper typically wouldn't do well during a recession. Do you not expect a recession and therefore copper? Like, what, why copper? I don't know if we're going to get a recession or not. I think once the Fed starts lowering, that's going to do well for the markets. Um, I'm ignoring the president's elections as I'm not happy with either choice. One's much worse than the other. Um, and I think, again, I, I, I do expect the general market and investors, funds and that start to start recognizing that everything they're doing is going to take metals. And we're just not producing and finding enough to meet that demand, and particularly in terms of copper, rare earth with China, uh, trying to get away from all those kind of countries and self-source uh, self those things, or at least do deals with countries that we can work with to uh, source those uh, elements and minerals. And then rare earths, you said, is there a, what's the fundamental reason behind it? Is that supply or demand more focused? I guess both. I think if, if you throw China out of the picture, sure. then you're stuck with, there's not a lot of rares anyway. Um, Brazil, I mean, there's two companies there that I own that have rares and I think they're viable. Um, but there's not that many places you can go for rares, at least the heavies. Right. So, I, and I expect that to do well. Okay. Anything else in terms of the battery stuff of the story? I mean, lithium, nickel, kind of hate it right now. Rick told me they're not as hated as he would like them to see. What do you make of it? Well, it means he's, he expects them to go down. I, I think there's plenty of lithium in the world. Um, I think that was overblown. And if Exxon and the oil companies figure out how to start pulling lithium out of their, uh, the brines coming out of their oil wells and such, or if the geothermal plants start figuring that out, then all these your lithium mines are in trouble because it's going to be much cheaper. Um, uranium, I think uranium is a good place to be. Um, still? I mean, you and I spoke about a year and a half ago or something like that, and you were still uh, kind of uh, not sure in uranium, but you were semi-bullish, I believe, for something like those lines. I might got that wrong, though, so correct me. A few me, years but, ago, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, I, I do believe nuclear energy is going to continue to be more and more accepted in, in the Western world. And I think that's going to drive demand. And people with deposits that are viable are going to be able to put those in production. So I want to be invested in a company with 
basically a profitable, yeah. permittable deposit Good. that's not 10 years down the road. All right, well, as you know, I've, we've interviewed multiple times. That is not the game that I play. But I'll let my portfolio do the speaking, and I just put out the, uh, the latest MJG investor letter, and we're 36% uh, weighted towards copper, um, which is our highest weighting uh, towards that uh, metal uh, since the partnership's inception hmm. uh, back 13 years ago. So I'll, I'll, let, I'll let the portfolio do the talking here, and we'll, I'll say copper with the, with the understanding that each of our investments that are exposed to copper we're, we're in it because we believe that there's the potential for share price appreciation for a catalyst outside of the copper price. So with each of these names, I think there's the ability for share price outperformance, even if copper stays flat. That could be through uh, drill results, uh, that could be through permitting success, uh, or that could be action on the M&A front. So I do want to be very clear, but I'll, I'll, I'll go with copper for this question. Do you think copper might have a challenging time ahead, uh, given the uncertainty in the economy, presidential elections, potential recession and stuff like that? Do you think the next 12 months might be challenging for copper? Yeah, it depends on the broader market. Um, I do think we're due for a market dislocation at some point here in the next couple couple years. Um, if you told me that there was going to be a, uh, if you looked in your crystal ball and told me that there was going to be a market dislocation nine months from now, then I would change my answer from sure. copper. So I think for the copper pick to bear out, at least over the next uh, 12 months, we're going to need the uh, broader markets to remain generally sanguine or you know continue to march higher as they have been. Right now, a commodity that I've never really had interest in, but given just how contrarian the setup is, uh, I'm going to go on a limb and say I think platinum may well be uh, 12 months time uh, could be a candidate. Um, the, the technical setup and the fundamentals are really aligning. Um, and I have a hunch that if it if it breaks out above sort of $1,200, $1,300 an ounce, we could see one of those kind of rapid breakout. You know, it wouldn't, wouldn't surprise me if we see 50% or even you know 100% type mm -hmm. moves uh, within you know 12, 18 months. Obviously speculative, but yeah. the setup looks good to me. Well, I appreciate the uniqueness because everyone's already told me gold and silver. Uh, <laughs> but why platinum? Is it supply or a demand story? Uh, a little bit of both. Um, I mean, you know, the vast majority of platinum is produced out of South Africa, which, you know, has been uninvestable or, or close to it for, for a long time. Um, it's been in a 17-year bear market. I mean, it hasn't really had a proper bull run since I think it peaked in 20, 2007, 2008, and it's basically been in a downtrend since then. You know, even silver's had little mini bull markets, you know, along that time, which is another one of the sort of long-term hated contrary metals. Um, on top of that, you know, a lot of the pessimism out there was related to the fact that people thought EVs were going to truly dominate the market and that there wouldn't be a market for catalytic converters um, in your traditional combustion engine vehicles. Um, that clearly hasn't happened or at least hasn't happened as fast as people thought. Um, you've had really rapid growth in things like the hybrid vehicle segment which actually use more PGEs in the catalytic converters um, than, than traditional ICE vehicles. So you've had a demand story that's actually stayed relatively robust and you've had stagnant supply and I think the supply side is could well be about to hit an inflection point lower due to the, the way capital cycles work and the lag effect between lack of investment and dropping production. Um, so there's, there's a whole lot of things that could work in our favour. Obviously, you know, things change rapidly, um, but I've, you know, platinum's been one of the new things I have, I don't, I don't think I've ever bought in my career in size and I've been nibbling away at personally myself and uh, for clients. So. So this is the, the, the 2017 equivalent of cobalt? 2017 equivalent to cobalt, yeah. It reminds me a lot of the uranium set up too, mm. three or four years ago, you know, no one cared. Um, you know, there was a lot of pessimism, you know, nuclear's dead, you know. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of similarities I see to the uranium space four or five years ago as well. So I would still probably stick with gold first. However, if gold runs again, and it is gonna run again, we just don't know when or how much, but it's going to run again, and if it does, then silver is going to outperform gold. Okay. But if it doesn't run very big, then I think gold will outperform silver and be the leading metal. Um, you know, in the next 12 months, who knows if we get a recession? So that would affect copper, lithium, maybe uranium. But you know what? Those are all bull markets. And the great thing about your question is, I don't have to answer it in my portfolio. I just own all the miners with these metals. So. so I work for a gold company now, which makes me want to say gold, but um, I'm a big uranium bull. 
I really believe in uranium. I believe that uranium is increasingly recognized as fundamental to answer the energy gap in the future as a baseload power with very, very low carbon footprint and very good safety records. I mean, way outstrips coal, for instance, on those fronts. Um, and there just isn't enough uranium. And then you layer in the political aspects of uranium where now, you know, U.S. utilities are not going to be allowed to import, Russia, import uranium from Russia within a few years. There's a lot of political pieces that are underway. I think uranium has made a big move and it's consolidating that move right now, but I do think uranium is going to go higher. I would say, if you put it that way, probably silver and junior silver miners because I, uh, I think we've begun a new rally in gold. I think the markets are starting to uh, factor in and price in an upcoming rate cut by the Fed, probably starting in September. And silver in this kind of an environment always outperforms gold. Silver miners, junior silver mining companies, outperform silver. So in that way, you have a gold which is leveraging a macro move and silver provides leverage on top of that and you get added leverage with the silver miners, the silver exploration and development companies. Do you think the macro is going to support all of that, that that you're saying? And I'm, I'm specifically thinking about the next 12 months and I'm kind of programmed to ask that question, but we talk about interest rates. You guys have an election that's going to be going on. There's a, a lot of things happening all at the same time. General view on the macro, where do you think that leads us? The macro for resources or for uranium? I'm sorry. No, the, just the macro, um, more like macro economics, and then drill it down, yeah, translate it to the resources. I think the macro is challenging. Um, I think that you will have a risk off period in the next 12 months, uh, and the tertiary assets will be uh, hard to find a bid for. And there's no assets on the planet that are more tertiary than junior mining stocks. So I suspect we'll have some interesting times. I uh, suspect, based on history, that one of the things that will happen as a consequence of that is that you may say, see another round of quantitative easing. If you see that, uh, and I don't know when that'll occur, uh, if you see another round of quantitative easing, if you see a substantial lowering of interest rates, but particularly lowering, lower interest rates combined with uh, credit creation, then I think you see the gold and silver markets truly off to the races. Mm. I, I remember that situation before you were born in 1975. You had the Fed tightening interest rates, which caused the gold price to fall by half, 74, 75. And then you saw the Fed lose their nerve, lower interest rates, and you saw gold run from literally $100 to $850 in five years. So if you have a circumstance where you have the type of uh, political and economic disruption that causes the Fed to intervene again, then all bets are truly off in the precious metals markets. How do you know I was not born in 75? <laughs> I'm old, but I have eyes. <laughs> do you think the macro is also going to stay supportive of uranium as in after presidential elections, after potential rate cuts, after potential recession, all these things, is that going to stay supportive of uranium? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, yes, it will, because first of all, these are acts that are they're going to be in play. They've already been signed into law by the by the Biden White House. Um, and if Biden stays in power, or someone on the Democratic side is in power in the White House, or it's the President uh, Trump White House, um, the idea of supporting our nuclear energy programs and domestic supply of uranium is is actually a bipartisan idea. It's one of the few things um, that, from an administration perspective, um, we have bipartisan support. It doesn't mean that every person in Congress supports it the same way, but it does mean that overall, the more power Powerful players, and I spend a lot of time on the Hill, the more powerful players in Washington all understand that need for nuclear power um, for a couple reasons. One is it's, it's in between um, older transitional uh, fuels like natural gas, like coal, like oil, um, which the Republicans support, and the newer fuels um, are energy uh, sort of power sources, uh, sun, solar, hydro, uh, which the Democrats tend more to support. It actually occupies an economic sliver in between those two things. It's clean. Um, it allows more power to go on to um, our system and we are going to create more technologies on these on these micro levels to basically place nuclear power throughout our defense bases and throughout communities around the country and I think both sides of the aisle support that so I, I don't see that changing uh, from the United States political perspective or all other countries that are also 
refocusing on their on their nuclear energy uh, platforms and policies. The macro. Let's go back to the macro then for a second. Just general high level overview. Everyone's talking about rate cuts. How many rate cuts are we going to see? Are we going to see? Them? Are we going back to QE? Is there something that can stop this train? Well, first, you know I'm a due diligence guy. My people pay me money for my thumbs up or thumbs down on a company or my ideas for companies and my research. I'm not an economist, you know, so you're... <laughs> you are an economist, you I could, suppose. You're not a PhD I'm economist. Not a professional economist. The government doesn't think okay. you're an economist, so, which actually means you're doing something right. So I won't dodge the question, but just for context, right? Okay, so the way I see it is I do think we're still headed for that hard landing. I do think we'll see more rate cuts than the mainstream is expecting. I think that could easily start this year. We are at that inflection point now. We're not just inflection point. We're at the point now where the long-term unemployment three-year moving average has crossed over the actual current rate, which is what I call the Gundlach indicator. Jeff Gundlach has been pointing out that for 80 years, this is the foolproof recession indicator. And by the way, with almost zero lag. Mm. So according to the Gundlach indicator, we should be in the future recognizing the recession starting about now or recently. Recently, not in the future. So we'll see. Um, that implies these rate cuts no, sort of no matter what. And if on top of that, if I'm right, and it's slowly at first, then all at once, the ice breaks, whatever metaphor you want, the labor market, I think, has been artificially masked uh, by the post-COVID, you know, labor hoarding and these sorts of things. So I think when it breaks, it breaks big. I, I think bad things will happen. But you know what? If I'm wrong, the, the mainstream guidance is still for a rate cut or two, and that's bullish gold. How do you think the macro is going to look like to confirm your thesis? Because we're talking 12 months here, and now it's kind of short term. Uh, maybe it's more entertainment than it is any type of education. But do you think the macro is going to be supportive of gold over specifically the next 12 months? And why do you think that? I do. Look, I do. But, I, but again, you know, and, I, and I, I'm going to talk about me personally because there's no point in me trying to talk about other people because mm -hmm. I don't know that. I'm not looking to invest in gold for a 12-month period, right? I've been investing in gold since 2003. So I'm 21 years in and gold over those 21 years has done a phenomenal job for me of doing what I invested it for, which was to protect and preserve and actually enhance my purchasing power. So the next 12 months, I think are going to be an extension of that 21 years. They may not go up in a straight line. We may see periods in that 12 months where it's underperforming, but I don't really care. I'm not looking for price appreciation in gold. As long as over a period of time, uh, my purchasing power is safe and it will end up enhanced, I'm very happy. I, I, I spend so little time looking at the gold price, it would scare you, even though I'm a gold investor. It's, it's, it's arguably the most irrelevant thing to me in the entire gold space is the price. It's the last thing I look at. When you invest in gold, are we talking about stocks or is the majority of your money in, in physical gold? I've, I've, I'm mostly physical. I, now, over the years, I've bought and sold stocks for periods where I think the gold stocks are going to have a run, but I'm, a, I'm an investor in gold. I'm a speculator in gold stocks. I don't invest in gold stocks because I just think they're too capricious. There's too much volatility. They don't set up well to be an investor unless you are a Rip Rule, a Ross Beatty, a Lucas London. You really have your finger on that pulse. For me, I can look at the prices and I can speculate when I feel like the company is going to outperform. But I find gold is something I can invest in and gold um, equities are things I can speculate in. Yeah. Why well, I ask you that specific question is because I'm thinking about going back to the macro environment. Do you think that's going to be supportive of the gold? equities because that again it seems to be a completely different thing where we're currently still seeing that discrepancy between uh between the performance of gold and, and, and gold equities so i'm talking about i mean what, what are you what are you seeing in macro are you seeing rate cuts coming and and putting you know a little bit of pressure under the gold stocks pushing them up or what else are you seeing well and this is the interesting thing that's peculiar to precious metal stocks right you you can have yes to all of the above it does not mean that gold stocks are going to do what you think they're going to do, right? And they've proven that over and over and over and over again. And so that's why they're such a difficult thing to invest in, because they're so, they are capricious and they will throw you off. They will not act like you think you're too, they'll exasperate you and you'll kick them out right before they go crazy. So again, you know, the, the most important thing for me, and this is what I'm going to be talking about tomorrow, is you need to know who you are. Are you an investor? Are you a speculator? And if you're an investor, what does that mean? If you're a speculator, what does that mean? The main difference is risk tolerance and time frame. 
So if you're an investor, you have to have a much longer time frame. If you're a speculator, you generally need to have a shorter time frame and much more risk tolerance. So, you know, mining equities will test your patience. They will absolutely necessitate a strong risk tolerance and they will require you to have multiple time frames in the space for an investment and be much more nimble getting in and getting out when you see things getting uh, overbought or oversold. And that's a very specific discipline that some people are incredibly good at and some people are ill-suited for. And, and you really need to know if you are ill-suited for that because if you are, you'll lose an awful lot of money. All right, so look, so the price of everything is really, really high, but it's only held up by a few transactions. And I mean, let's talk about like, you know, these high price stocks, right? Like the, the actual volume trading these stocks is getting really, really low. So if everybody decided they wanted that money, right? I mean, it's 55 trillion of US equity value. If like 5 trillion wanted to come out, the whole thing topples, right? It's same thing happening in real estate, right? If you notice the amount of real estate trading in the US is going down, and the prices aren't going down that much, people are just freezing in place, okay? So the thing for people to watch is find these markets where the value is held up because people are used to that number and they're not willing to come down. And so that's a sign that as that volume goes down, some people are gonna say, look, I have to sell now. And when they start selling, you have this quick correction. Now, as you know, markets don't go down for years at a time anymore. What happens is they just go straight down an elevator shaft and then we have a rescue and they come straight back up, right? So we used to have what's called bear markets. And for people that are younger than 35, they never lived through one of these things before. But they would go down for like a year and a half or something. And then the economy would slow and things would get tough and they would come back. That doesn't happen anymore. So now, you know, what you have to watch out for is this panic. Think about COVID. Three weeks, the market lost a third of its value. And then the Fed stepped in overnight and bought all these risky things and then things shot back up. So how do you play that? I mean, if you try to trade that, you're crazy. I mean, you'll sit in a short position for two years and you know, you'll, you'll lose half your money before the miracle happens. And so I think right now people have to look at a scenario where they're like, okay, what are the things that I might wanna sell in the next year? And some of those things I should probably sell now while there's a great bid so that I have enough what I do personally is, you know, I write a newsletter, the Tucker letter, and, you know, I write books. I, know this stuff. I mean, I have this, like, independent life. And if I need to buy something big, like a house or whatever, I'm not waiting until, like, you know, two weeks before, you know, to do that. I mean, if I have a huge tax bill or something coming up, I mean, I'm planning for those things. And I, I realize that, that this election coming up, I and mean, we have, think about it, you see all the headlines. I mean, mm -hmm. we're just perfectly set up for some sort of, like, Sunday night, shock event you know and the market opens down monday morning you know some big number and and everybody says i man i knew i should have done something and so you're not trying to trade that you're not trying to like be a hero and to to make a whole bunch of money off some thing like this what you're trying to do is you want to outrun the other campers when the bear comes that's right. what you want to do right so you don't want to be the first out but you don't want to be the last out and i think this is the time to think about that because you have these high prices and I mean, if you look at smaller companies, they're down a lot more, but it's like people need to think about this in the sense of you can't hold this thing up forever. Now, long-term, it is going higher, right? So like the gold price, you know, we can talk about that if, if it's okay with you, but the gold price, like retail people are selling gold. Like the average person is not a gold buyer, they're a gold seller. And I know that because I talk to a lot of the dealers, I have a large dealer that I use myself. And uh, what they tell me is that the phone rings 10 times, there's eight sellers and two buyers, right? I mean, and those sellers are people that bought gold because Mr. T sold it to them or something in 2010 or 11, and they thought the government was gonna go bankrupt, and the government's just more bankrupt, and you know, the gold price is finally where they bought and they're gonna sell, and what that tells you is it's probably gonna go higher. And, and so uh, uh, that's a huge indicator. I mean, I'm a big believer in uh, anecdotal things that you notice, you know, in your life. And that's one of the biggest things that I notice. When all those people are selling, I want to be buying. You know, if I see all those people buying and Mr. T is telling them to buy, it's a time to sell. So right now the opposite is happening and, and the price is, I think it's going to keep moving up. I think the rate cuts would be nothing more than spitting in a swimming pool. And if they do them this late in the game as, as they're all predicting, you know, first there was going to be four or five rate cuts for sure this year. And then, uh, well, maybe one. And and then maybe none, and now maybe there'll be another one here. It's political at this point of the game, and a 25 basis point decrease in interest rates does nothing. Um, I think ultimately rates go higher, not directed by the Federal Reserve, but directed by the economy, by the market, when we see 
good portion of the creditors who have been funding our spending addiction starting to shed bonds and buy things, tangible things, like copper, like gold, like silver, real things, commodities that cannot be weaponized and confiscated the way that we have done with the Russian Forex reserves and their, and their treasury holdings. And so, yeah, to me, um, ultimately, long-term long interest rates go much higher. The short end that the Fed says they're going to lower by 25 basis points to me is, is nothing but earrings on a pig. Well, uh, when you say flows, the first thing that, that comes to my mind, because it's so unusual, is you've got gold and gold stocks moving up and you've got money still continuing to flow out of gold funds. So you look at the gold ETFs, other than the Asian ETFs, but the Europe, North American and the European ETFs are all seeing consistent outflows of money. And even if you look at the gold stock ETFs, like the GDX, they are seeing outflows. If you look at the GDX for the last three months, there have only been about seven days with net inflows. I mean, it's astonishing when you think that we're at, you know, what's happened to the stocks. You look at most gold mutual funds, and they are seeing consistent outflows of money. Now, as a contrarian, I think that's a very, very positive sign because it means that ordinary investors are still not convinced. They're still not in this market. They're taking the opportunity to, to actually reduce their holdings. So from that point of view, I'm very positive. You know, on rate cuts and everything, I'm not sure I have too much to say that, you know, other people haven't said, but everybody knows the Fed's in a, in a r real quandary. But I think it's important to really emphasize that and to really focus on that. There is no easy way out for the Fed. I'm not a Fed defender, because I think the Fed, not necessarily Jerome Powell, but the Fed got itself into this mess itself. But having said that, if you look at where we are right now, there is no easy way out for them. Um, if they cut rates, they really risk inflation moving back up stronger than it otherwise would, because let's not fool ourselves, inflation is not under control by any means. You know, if you've got CPI at 3.6% or CPI for people who don't eat and use power at 3.3, that's still more than 50% above their own target. And then you look at what oil price has done in the last, uh, you know, six weeks from 72 or whatever to 80 whatever, one. You know, all of that higher oil price feeds into every good in the stores through transportation. So inflation's not killed. So. You know, but if they keep things, if they keep rates higher for longer, if they keep them at this level for too long, then the longer they keep them on, the more risk there is of companies and households getting into serious trouble. Well, I mean, when we went into the year, obviously, uh, like in the fourth quarter of last year, people were thinking that there would be six interest rate cuts uh, in, uh, in 2024. We haven't had one yet. But the market has moved recently because the jobs number was lower than people expected. There was revisions, and now we had uh, also inflation moderating. So the expectation is maybe for one this year, but that's still driving the market up. And we had a good move in the equities before because the problem uh, the problem is, as, as well you know, is is that most of the gold price lift has been on central bank buying which doesn't spill over into equities. When we do have moves where ETFs start seeing inflows because real interest rates are going down, that will spill over in equities and did last week when the GDXJ outperformed uh, uh, gold. Right, so you think that that's actually what's gonna drive equity prices and this time around oh, yeah. rate cuts. You told me M&A a couple of weeks ago too. Yeah, well the M&A is more about the gold price. Uh, so those guys have money, but they don't have any growth. So they will focus on development stories, but what we've seen is more people acquiring production because they don't want the risk of permitting, they don't want the risk of building, they don't want the risk of the capital overrun. They'd rather just pay a premium on production. And so yeah. we've gone through some production acquisitions, but you know now we're seeing development, like Oco West with Reunion, that was acquired. I think another one that will be acquired eventually will be Akari in Finland. That's another nice deposit. Uh, so yeah, I think we'll, we shall see more M&A because it's it's still that orphan period for a lot of these uh, single asset companies. Uh, but uh, you know, we should see development companies uh, take the uh, take the plunge on decent jurisdictions where people understand how to build. Well, I think rate cuts are probably baked in. I mean, it's going to happen. Um, this idea that pivot's going to really in, do well for the gold industry, I kind of doubt it. I think it's going to be much better for the overall market in general. 
I try to expect that to happen. Um, this year, though, and like in the next 12 months? Yeah, I do. Um, I think base metals, particularly copper and uh, rare earths, they're what I'm trying to focus in on. That's a bit of gold and silver. Yeah. Um, that's so, what I'm focusing. But in terms of the macro, if we just go back to that for a second, I'll, I'll ask you about the metals here in a second, okay. too. Um, but what exactly are you looking for in macro to kind of give you a starting shot of, oh, now we're going to start doing well in the metals? Like, are you looking for those rate cuts? Are, are you looking for more QE, president, excuse me, presidential elections or something else? I think what I'm looking for is the overall market to lose a bit of excitement in the high tech stuff that's been, been going nuts and start recognizing that metals are what it's going to take to drive all of this high tech uh, energy conversion, that sort of thing. I think that's what I'm waiting for, and I think that is going to come. Well, what do you think about the macro, though? Because now you're talking kind of like sector macro, but what about global macro, and how's that, how, how's that going to influence uh, platinum or, or all the other stuff? Well, you know, I mean, platinum used to be considered a precious metal, right? Um, now there's very little of demand goes into investment demand, so I'm not even considering the potential kind of rejuvenation of investment demand. But if platinum even gets a sniff of... Uh, you know, investment demand coming back in. That's, you know, from geopolitical, monetary, whatever, you know, um, volatility, um, general growth in demand for precious metals, which I think we're all fairly bullish on. You know, you can layer that on top and, you know, I think it looks even more rosy. So I don't even consider that when I'm looking at my sort of bull case for the next 12, 18 months for platinum. Yeah. What do you think about global macro? Like, what are we seeing right now? What are some of the main things that you're paying attention to? I mean, there's, there's obviously a, a sort of breakdown in the sort of unipolar geopolitical framework, right? I mean, the, the U.S. is almost certainly, you know, its dominance over the, the control of the, the globe is, I don't know if it's falling off a cliff, but it's, it's this major crack starting to, to appear. So, I mean, I think one of the big trends, you know, globalization, I think, has peaked. I think we are going to be dealing with a much more flat, fractured world moving forward, a lot more uncertainty. That should be good for things like precious metals where you, know, you need um, counterparty risk-free collateral assets, so precious metals you know, should do very well under that scenario. Commodities and hard assets in general should, should, be, should do very well. You know, there, there are there are nuances to it, though. You know, I'm I'm still thinking through how I see a you know a world where supply chains that are fractured and you can't get you know everything you need tomorrow. You know, from in, anywhere in the world. Um, you know, some commodities will probably do quite well out of that, particularly if they're less abundant in Western-friendly countries. If you live in the West, um, some industries may cease to exist because they can't get the raw materials and things like that. So that could have negative impacts elsewhere. Um, but I think, you know, if I was looking for the next 10 years, I think that breakdown in the, the, the sort of globalized, you know, easy everything sort of, um, you know, the, the world just had it very good for the last 20 or 30 years. Yeah. And I, I think we're in for a little rougher ride <laughs> the next 20, in my opinion. You don't think the Fed's going to swoop in and save it with a bunch of liquidity? I mean, they, they probably will. They probably almost certainly will. Um, whether that'll have their desired effect this time around, uh, you know, last time it was almost deemed as in there, de deemed as if they are saving the system and, you know, at the broader asset markets, particularly, you know, big tech um, went bananas, bananas right? Um, yep. This time around with the debt where it is, I'm not 100% sure it's going to have the same effect. I mean, we're almost past the point of no return, you know, in terms of debt servicing at, you know, even the current interest rates, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, it's just simple math. It, yeah. it looks a little scary. So The great thing is I don't have to answer because I own gold. I own physical gold, a meaningful amount, meaning around 20% of all of my assets are in physical gold. So that, that protects me against a lot of things. It also, uh, rate cuts, no rate cuts, recession, no recession. If I own a lot of cash, then I don't have to worry about that answer either. In the macro, I, I don't really spend a lot of time trying to figure out what the Fed may do. You know, I could be wrong. Lots of people are wrong all the time. Same with the recession. I was convinced in 2021 we were having a recession. 
the inverted yield curve said so, and it had been right the last seven recessions, and it, it's been wrong. So, who, but who knows what's, what's going to happen? There could be many other catalysts in the meantime as well. Whatever happens, pay dirt, one may say. <laughs> That's right. I'm after pay dirt, not after trying to figure out the fit. As it pertains to gold, which is sort of where there's too much to talk about, so I'm going to focus it down on gold. There's been a lot of nebulous forces around for years, deglobalization, de-dollarization, that in the last few years have become very real, have become very present. So obviously we had COVID and all of the impacts that that had on, on the, all, of, all of the ways that that revealed the fragility of our global market. Then we had the Russia-Ukraine situation and those really turned real things that had been ideas, I feel like. And now that's like, to me, one of the most significant forces in the world right now is that the world is dividing, the world is fracturing, um, and systems that had been the basis of globalization are being dismantled. And so that's the gold argument, right? That's the gold argument in a nutshell, is that Ch the Chinese central bank is buying gold hand over fist because of de-dollarization and deglobalization. You know, Saudi Arabia is doing transactions for oil in gold because it knows that it needs to diversify away from the US dollar. There's gonna be all kinds of impacts from deglobalization and de-dollarization, and they're still going to be slow processes, but increasingly when you, but increasingly people are acting on them now, and it only amplifies the argument for gold when you layer on all the other things, mostly, you know, significant amounts of debt in the world and how uh, countries in particular are going to manage that debt. So those are the things that I think really matter and those are the things that are creating a gold price at record levels um, and driving interest to gold. What about over the short run and uh, what matters over the short run? Is it interest rates, uh, something else? Yeah. For gold, I think what matters in the short run are two things. Um, Chinese buying. So Chinese buying has been the thing that has powered the gold market. And I think it's really important to discuss that for a moment because for a bunch of years, I feel like all investors in the West sort of have watched the gold price rise and have not really understood why. And it's understandable that they didn't get it because almost for many decades, the gold price really only rose when Western investors were driving it. So Western investors always drove the gold price higher. And when they did that, they were buying gold equities and it was the talk of the town and they were doing it for a variety of reasons, economic risk, inflation, uh, interest rates, those sorts of things. In the last few years, none of those um, traditional rationales have made any sense. We've been in a rising interest rate environment, but gold has been going higher. So we came up with arguments for why that was the case, but those arguments didn't really work. The reason gold rose in the last few years is because Chinese central banks started buying it and then Chinese citizens reverted to gold after two decades of incredible growth in China, a period when there was all kinds of opportunities and places for Chinese wealth to grow. They have tr they've gone through a paradigm shift. Their economy is not in a phase of dramatic growth right now. It is now going into hopefully a sustainable period. and so. Interest rates are no good, the stock market is risky, the real estate market has exploded, the places where money had been sitting aren't comfortable anymore. So if you look at gold trading on the Shanghai exchange, it too has shot through the roof. So Chinese gold buying is a very important driver of gold in the short term and that continuing. And the other is interest rates because if interest rates get cut and we on top of the Chinese buying start to get that more traditional force, which is Western investors buying gold in a rising real rate or a falling real rate environment, then you get a double whammy in gold. Yeah, it's it's essentially a switch to the rate cutting side of the cycle, um, and uh, the Fed is going from rate hiking to rate cuts. The markets, all the risk assets are anticipating that, starting to price that in. All of them are going to rise, but because that's uh, at its foundation a monetary factor, then monetary metals like gold and silver I think are going to perform better than most other asset classes. Now, I mean, with, with uranium being uh, your number one pick for the next 12 months, how do you get exposure to it is I assume maybe a combination of, of going along the physical thing, maybe through the Sprott um, physical trust 
but also the equities. And I want to go that direction of the equities. I know we just recently went to Brazil. I know you, you, you travel around, you look at these things. I saw you talking to some of the companies here. What jurisdictions do you like? And what jurisdiction do you do, do you dislike when it comes down to uranium? Well, in terms of uranium, we um, in the United States actually have um, a number of places that have supplies, and it's a question of getting those those mines back online, and that's one of the beautiful things because between the United States and Canada, um, we actually can supply um, a lot of the growth in uranium that's needed. It's a question of greater technologies, more economic efficiencies, and, 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 and sort of resetting those operations and also replenishing operations that already exist throughout the country. That's Wyoming, that's Texas, um, in, in other states around the country, as well as regions in, in Canada. So that's where uh, c companies like Kamiko, which um, isn't at this conference, but um, w which owns a lot of uh, mine supply throughout Canada. So, so I think North America really has um, the ability to um, pace in itself more quickly um, in the uranium space. Um, in terms of Brazil, um, it's, it's kind of the ancillary space of uranium. Um, there's a lot of rare earth element uh, finds in Brazil that are very close to the surface of the earth. What does that mean? It means that right now China uh, controls most of the rare earths in the world, some of which are byproducts of uranium, 60% of them and 90% of the, produ um, the production of manufacturing. The United States is, is uh, slowly realizing that it needs to um, really get a piece of that, and countries like Brazil are going to be important in that sort of middle space um, of supplying some uranium byproduct as well as rare earth elements byproduct because um, some of the sites there are easier to, to get to. And also these are jurisdictions, you know, United States, Canada, Brazil, that are just more friendly to the United States, um, have less internal instability, um, and aren't China or Russia or Kazakhstan. That's one. Uh, that's one check mark. Is is the country China? No, then it's good. Uh, but what about what about West Africa? I mean, that seems to be challenging. They've got a lot of uranium too. Uh, is there a jurisdiction that you wouldn't go? And what do you think of West Africa? That, that's actually a good question. That there are a, a number of sites, um, as you mentioned, in, in West Africa. Namibia has a lot of uranium, and, and, and there there have been uh, some some sort of political discord over those. Right now it's more stabilized. Um, and there are companies in Australia um, as well that, that produce in, in Australia, um, in the western part of Australia, and also in Western Africa that aren't Chinese companies. Um, and so it is a place for supply. It, it can get itself um, that uranium into domestic um, supply, allied supply chain banners um, for the United States and other countries that, that aren't China. Um, but, but yes, there is instability. Um, um, in, in Western Africa and different countries that, that can pop up. And it's just something to to look at when you consider an investment in uranium. You, do, can you invest in a mine that's operational, that has a 10 or 15 or 20 year life, that has good technology, that actually has good environmental uh, protection or sustainability mechanisms around it, that actually adheres to some of those hmm. international regulations and also makes money. Um, and, and you can do that with some of these other countries. Yeah. Uh, I think you meant Niger, uh, and that's what I also meant. I think you said Namibia. Namibia's uh, one. There's, there's a large, there actually uh, is a company called DPL, um, okay. DPLO, which yeah. is based in Australia, but okay. it has a, has a site out there. Because Namibia but, yes, seems to be stable. Also. Namibia is stable. Um, okay, yeah. but, 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 but there have been, there have been some, some, some issues politically yeah. um, over the last year. So okay. it's not a question of 100% stable or non-stable. It's just that you have to recognize okay. that in some of these areas there is a potential um, for more political instability or mm. more internal civil instability than in other areas. Right. W what about Niger then in that, in that case? I mean, Niger is, is unstable as, as of yet, arguably. Uh, it, it, yes, and um, this is again one of the reasons why if I'm, I'm looking at mines, it's not that there's not necessarily good supply coming from Niger, it's mm. just that Historically, there there have been and there continue to be um, elements of disruption within you know, the political system there and you know, th throughout down to the ground, um, and to workers on the ground and to instability sort of throughout. Um, it isn't to say again that, that supply can't come from these places. It does come from these places. It's just that if I'm looking at um, particularly coming into this space, looking at an investment over, over the near term, I want to be in a place where it's just not as much of a worry. Mm. Where, where the mine is still good, where the supply is still there, where it's efficient, and where I don't have to worry as much over um, potential political disruptions. Right. Our jurisdictions then. You can give me two jurisdictions. One, of, one that you would go into eyes closed, and one that uh -huh. you'd never go into. Oh, there is no eyes closed. I'm, I'm not just dodging the question. There is no eyes closed. Doug Casey famously likes to say, you can run, but you can't hide from political risk. I mean, even Quebec back in the day, I remember when Quebec scared everybody with some new tax proposal or something. There's nowhere, not Nevada, not Saskatchewan, nowhere. There's nowhere that's sacred. Um, 
you know, even if you're pro mining, you could have First Nations problems or whatever. Desert tortoises in Nevada, you know, th there is no eyes closed. Um, but I will say, and this is perhaps a little bit contra Rick, is I'm willing to pay a bit of a premium, not a huge, pre not a premium. I'm willing to pay closer or less of a discount. Let me put it that way. I'm willing, you know, I want to, I want a value proposition. I want to pay less than what I think it's worth, hmm. right? And I'll take less of a discount for a lower risk mining jurisdiction like Ontario or Nevada. I'm okay with that because I don't have to worry about my geologist getting shot up with AK-47s on the way to work. Hmm. I mean, maybe if they go to the wrong bar, it might be a shotgun blast, but not AK-47 central. Hmm. And I, I think that's worth paying for. So I'm sorry, that was a very shotgun answer to your question. No goes. Um, there are many, but I think the one worth mentioning right now is Mexico. I'm not putting any new money into Mexico. I have removed Mexico risk from my portfolio because it's clearly, visibly going the wrong way. It has been for a while, and I think the new president is seriously bad news. Uh, and we'll see. If I'm wrong, the silver will still be there on the ground, and I'll still have some stocks that I can buy that I, you know, discoveries are made, the companies are working on them. Uh, you all know who I mean. <laughs> um, but yeah, now I, I would not risk a dollar, a single dollar more in Mexico until they show that they're uh, open for business for mining. Are you going to see the wolf population in West Africa increase anytime soon? Could do, I don't know. Look, I mean, I, look, I, I, I feel safest like most people do, the US, Canada, Australia, right? Because I understand the rule of law. I understand the way the government works with the mining industry. Um, and I understand, to a large extent, how the policy procedure happens. But outside of there, there are all kinds of factors that are out of your control, and the risk jumps from those three. And then it, it ratchets higher with different jurisdictions. Not the UK? There's not really much choice in the UK. I mean, yes, the UK. You got some tin. Yeah, fine, but I don't want to invest in tin, so you know, that's that's uh, that's that's not for me. Good. What about the jurisdiction you'd never go in? Oh, there's tons of them. I mean, there's ton I mean, look, there are tons of them. There are tons of jurisdictions. That, I mean, I, and I know people that are very successful investors that won't go outside those three. They've made really good money just being in the US, Canada, or Australia, mm. and I completely understand that. Why? Why add risk that you don't need to risk? Now, if you're a speculator, as I said, if you understand who you are and you're a speculator, then maybe the jurisdictional risk is worth it to you. Mm. Fine, go take it. But understand, hey, there's a chance that all this could go away because of the, the government. And I'm comfortable with that risk. I'm not, so I stay away from it. Okay, so the best thing I can tell you is that about 2020, we went into this era that I call the world's going into zones. Okay? And there are zones of influence. And if you look at the map, you start seeing these certain zone that certain powers in the world influence. Yep. And you're noticing that it doesn't just happen overnight. You know, it happens slowly. Like, for example, India has kind of been on a lot of dates with different zones, right? They've kind of Good said, point. well, you know, we think we have to stay allegiant to the U.S., but that uh, Russians really do have some oil that we need, you know, so we better at least keep the dialogue open with them. And the U.S. says, you better... It's like dating, right? They're like, you better, you know, you better marry me if we're going to go out again. You see how it goes? And mm -hmm. so then the Chinese come in and they say, hey, India, I mean, we don't even like you and we're, you know, but we're your neighbor. And so you better deal with us, too. And then the Aussies say, well, you know, we can get you submarines. I mean, so you see how this goes. So watch how the world comes together, because it actually has nothing to do with what's happening today in that country. It has to do with what zone they end up in, because if they end up in the wrong zone, Forget about it, man. All that equipment's gone. And, you know, Indonesia is a famous example of this. You know, it's kind of like it, it has the ability to, it's trying to be a player, you know, in this process. It's working, actually. You know, they, they've done, they, 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 they took some steps, you know, in the last two years that kind of changed the, the way they interact with world powers, you know. They, hmm. they, 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 I think it's very interesting. And so, and so you, you have to say to yourself, like, look, I mean, that's a jurist. Uh, we're Western. I mean, I'm I'm Western. I don't have any choice in that. It's I was, when you're born an American, you're automatically and you have to pay tax forever. It doesn't matter what you do. So you don't have like a whole bunch of choice. Even if yeah. you leave, it's very difficult. So you have to be realistic about where your business is. I mean, if your business is you know is in uh, Europe or in Asia or something, you, you have to think about your zone because you're going to be able to operate in your zone, but you're not really going to be able to operate. So. 
you know, for me as an American, that, that zone really becomes the Americas. And South America is actually being contested. I mean, if you notice, I've been to Argentina a lot. It's like I've never seen so much Chinese influence there. And so, you know, you're not quite sure yet because you notice mining in Argentina is like coming back, right? And so you're not quite sure. Wait a second. I mean, you know, am I going to get trapped here again, right? Because the American dollars were trapped there for some time. But, but I think first things first is getting your mind in that zone mentality because otherwise you're just studying like the government in you know Ghana or something mm. on a one-off basis but it could be a nice government for a while and it's not in your zone and it's a problem you yeah. know because then the company is not able to operate really and to to function there mm. you know so and if you're in London there's a time zone bias it's a game changer but that is how I think about it and I've had a lot of success I've been on boards and things, and I'm not on any boards, so I think people are very confused about that, but I resigned from boards last year. I'm not on any boards. And some people were very kind of like, they didn't want to release that news, but I've not been on boards for all. But when I was on boards in the past, that's how we decided what to do, and that actually ended up being a, a good way to think yeah. about it. And for investors individually, it's the same thing. Gives you an insight into m and too, because if China, if, if your strategy is a takeout of your company, yeah. But the only possible takeout er is China and Canada blocks that. That could be an issue. Correct. Or if you're aim listed in London and the Chinese are taking it, it's no problem. Mm. You see, and it's and it's so that's that's where things get very specific to you know to right. your zone of influence. Yeah. And so I just think a lot of times people are way too focused on a company, mm. and they're not thinking about things like this bigger picture thing that we're talking about and all you have to do is learn and be curious and you know open your mind because it's philosophical really I mean that's the people are always stunned that I spend half my time doing things like like this and that are more philosophical than like mm -hmm. a real company analysis because that's actually not that hard mm -hmm. you know it's not like so difficult to what well, you figure that out over time you know yeah. and so and then the other piece of it is like charts and you know, the overall, I mean, that, that stuff's important as well. Sure. And so I think people get your, if you get your mind right with this stuff, the dollars will follow, mm. like the returns follow, you know, it's yeah. not luck. Yeah. This is not a luck game. Anywhere in North America, Canada, United States, and the one that would give me pause would be South Africa, probably. I mean, certainly any of the ones in jurisdictions where we see fluidity in, in um, policy, in economics, I mean, you look at South Africa, and we would think it's very stable, but they're one of the BRICS members, and we are seeing all of these transitions away from the Western system, BRICS being one of them. So South Africa, um, South America would be the two that I would have um, more reluctance to go into, uh, where you could see possible nationalization, you could see things change. And I shouldn't say South Africa, let's just say Africa. So Africa or South America would be the two places I would think twice about. Anywhere in North America wouldn't be an issue at all to me. That's not a fair question because things do change, and of course price price is important. Mm -hmm. So I could say, well, I really like Quebec, but if it's a hundred times more expensive than, you know, Yemen, it might be worth going to Yemen instead. Mm -hmm. So price is important, but but generally speaking. Um, I mean, my, the jurisdictions I wouldn't go into are the same ones nobody else would go into, like Yemen and North North Korea, and you know, I have a fairly high tolerance for risk. You go in West Africa? Oh yeah, oh nice. absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, both West and East Africa, in fact. So West Africa, um, we have mines in Tanzania. We have some companies we own with mines in Tanzania, with mines in Eritrea. Does that count as West Africa? I mean, it's Africa and it's West. But, um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's a company that I like a lot. Okay. What company is that? Well, it's called Alpha, Alpha Exploration. Okay. And the key there is, yes, Eritrea. Okay, and it's only in Eritrea. So if it goes wrong, they're in a problem. But, but the key to me in, in high-risk jurisdictions is, do the people have experience in that jurisdiction? And in the case of Alpha, you've got three people on the, on, on the team, you know, at the top of the team, who have done it before. They've made discoveries in Eritrea, they've sold, it, they've sold the mines or companies in Eritrea, made money for people. They know the country, they know the political, um, the political terrain, if you like, and the geologic terrain. Mm -hmm. 
So that's critical. But if someone, if someone you know, who last year was running a marijuana farm decides to open a, go to go to Yemen and open a mine, I'm not going to be interested in that. It's it's a matter of do they have experience? Yes. Yeah, so, equities. What's what would I look for in equities? First of all, scale. The problem is the industry has been flat for so long and was hit so hard. Um, you need institutional money to push it up and they tend to pick the big guys. They want liquidity and scale. Um, and as a result, you, some might say, well, the micros or the minis can get bought out. Yeah, but they don't get the full value of that. Somebody else is getting to, to where, you know, take their, their assets at and get it to the top valuation. So scale would be actually as undervalued. Um, so the big guys run first, then their PE starts stretching, and then they'll quickly be buying the others. So you want to watch the big, big names um, generally. The other, th well, you mentioned jurisdiction in your question as well. So I, the, the, the standard wisdom is that the West is the higher safety in Canada and US. And I'm inverting on that. I feel that the West is going more communist and is going to have real crisis with the debt collapse and be part of the worst. And there's going to be a lot of a tendency to become something they haven't been before. Whilst I actually think the old risk nations that are sort of the BRICS part might actually not respond in such anti-capitalist manners. So we're, seeing, we're actually seeing a pivot in reaction. So typically you would normally say North America great, Latin America a bit more sketchy, Africa super sketchy potentially on mining. Um, I actually think that could invert. So the jurisdiction thing is, is, is not a simple question uh, as it used to be. Uh, and you might find the premiums for North American don't hold. Um, you just have to look at Trudeau and his capital gains tax above 250,000. You know, mines start making money and governments are pressed. They're going to be under incredible duress. They're not going to be providing the services they'd committed to. It's that little void that you enter into and you're going to start seeing dirty deeds. Yeah, if, if I'm looking at a jurisdiction for copper, I, I think right now Peru's probably coming back uh, because they're trying to streamline permitting and they have have fallen, I think, uh, uh, down below uh, uh, the DRC with respect to uh, uh, global production and they want to get back up there. And so now I think that they might be pushing more production and also uh, pushing more permitting for exploration. So they're definitely on the other side. Uh, Chile is still a good jurisdiction, but I don't think a lot of things will change until the president uh, probably, uh, we have a new election like in a year and a bit. Mm. You know, so, and, and Brazil I've always liked, but the endowment is a bit different than Chile and Peru. Mm. That's a different quantum of copper there. Geologically, then you mean? Yes, yes. Uh, like the Carajas is very good uh, for uh, high-grade copper deposits. Uh, infrastructurally, it's sound. But in terms of total endowment, Peru and Chile are the best. Argentina's picking up with respect to the government making it easier for people to explore and now produce in that uh, country by eliminating duties and tariffs, lowering uh, taxes and also, uh, also allowing for repatriation now that will allow companies to get, take on debt where before they would have a hard time. Well, there's no place that's risk-free. So I think when you look at a country, you've got to drill, drill down to the actual province it's in or the jurisdiction, um, the politics and that. Like there's places in Argentina you could build a mine, places you can't. Same in the U.S., California, skip it. Nevada, great. Um, so in terms of places I'm... I would definitely go into Nevada and Brazil mm. and Finland. Okay. That's uh, three. I ask you for one. Give me one. Sorry, What's the top one of those three? <laughs> Brazil. Brazil? Oh, mm. interesting. What jurisdiction would you not go in? Oh, jeez. Niger. Okay. <laughs> There's a lot of uranium in there. Yep. Okay. <laughs> I would not go there. Not at all? Not at all. Okay, well, what has to change there for you to go in there? Like, you want to see the ECOWAS coming in, the West getting um, getting back control, or like? I think it's just a disaster case. I mean, there's a bunch of disaster case countries that I wouldn't go into because if you're lucky enough to find something or own something that's worthwhile, they're going to take it. If it's the right management team with the right project, as you mentioned, I'm uh, um, willing to take risk on particular jurisdictions. Um, but if you were to ask me one particular jurisdiction, I would narrow it a little bit, and I'd say the Carajás Mineral Province uh, within Para State uh, in Brazil. 
Um, our, two actual, our two largest holdings are both exposed to that area. So again, I'm letting the portfolio uh, do the talking. But right. this is an area with excellent mining um, infrastructure. This is an area with uh, numerous metal mines in production, uh, large amount of uh, mining service providers and labor available, and also just incredible mineral potential. So that would be my, that would be my answer for preferred jurisdiction, understanding that it's a, a nuanced question. Good. What about, a question, uh, what about a jurisdiction that you wouldn't go in, no matter the merits of the project? Well, I guess number one on my list, and this may be disappointing to some listening, but would be Ecuador. Um, I, I think it's a wonderful country. I think it has tremendous uh, mineral potential. I think there's a lot of smart geologists and good, good teams working in country. But I got my fingers burned um, with our one previous investment in, in Ecuador. And uh, I do know, again, it's nuanced within the jurisdiction as it is within any jurisdiction, but there's a lot of social uh, pushback against, against mining just because it doesn't have a long history of, of mineral extraction within, within the country. So that's, that's one country that I'd probably be most inclined to, to avoid at this point in time. Ecuador seems to be improving though now. What, what would it take for you to start liking it again? probably have to see a couple mines permitted and actually put into production uh, relatively smoothly. So I, I probably want to give it a few years before I'm willing to, to change my mind on that jurisdiction at large. Right now, I mean, I, I think Australia is the best place to do exploration right now. Fitting. Yeah. yeah I, well, I'm a Kiwi, so Aussie's, a, Aussie's <laughs> the, the sort of friendly enemy almost. But uh, yeah, I, th I, I think of the safe jurisdictions, you know, if we're talking Canada, US, Australia, I still think Australia is probably the best place to do business. It definitely has the most vibrant capital markets for the juniors right now, I would say. Um, so that's one I wouldn't hesitate to dive into. Um, what was the, sorry, what was the second part of the what's, an, uh, what's another jurisdiction that you wouldn't go in? Wouldn't go in. Um, no matter the technical merits of the project. That's an interesting question. I mean, if a project is really good enough, I'm pretty open to quite a high degree of jurisdictional risk. If there's a truly tier one discovery, in my experience, the project finds a way to get done. Um, you know, it's actually improved recently. I would have said South Africa um, a couple of weeks ago mm. before the election result there. So I'm okay. going to be curious to see how that, if, if there is any change out of South Africa. Um, yeah. I mean, I, we've invested in places like, the, you know, DRC, which is pretty high risk for most, um, la large parts of Africa, you know, we've invested heavily and I've done well yeah. in. So I am I am fairly jurisdictionally risk tolerant, I would say. Yeah. Um, the project just has to be good. It's a tie for first, it'd be either Quebec or Nevada, and they're always ranked at the top of the Fraser survey, mining surveys every year. So Quebec and Nevada, I love. Where's Expensive though. Expensive to drill, hard to permit, takes a long time. There's challenges. Well, there are challenges everywhere. It, 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 you know, it takes long to permit in BC. You know, uh, Nevada's got. Uh, uh, they respect property rights. They have the system down. Same with Quebec. The Quebec government actually has an exploration arm. A lot of people don't know this. They go out and actually explore, and then companies can come in and take those uh, assets over if they want and buy them. So. Quebec's very pro-mining, there, there's no doubt about that. Everybody wants to protect the environment and they're gonna do that as well, and we should. Uh, ones I wouldn't go into, that's, I mean, you know, I'm not gonna go into Venezuela and Russia and China. Uh, to be honest, I, I'm, I'm not in West Africa right now, um, just because of what's going on there. We'll see this time next year if maybe it's improved, more stable, but right now I'm on the sidelines with that. Uh, West Africa is a big place though. There's a couple of countries, say Cote d'Ivoire, Guinea's doing fine. Um, would you consider it on an asset per asset base? Like if you like the asset a lot, you'd still go in or? I just want to make sure there's not going to be any spillover with the, the protests and the riots and the you know, the upheaval in neighboring countries. That, that's an issue for me. I don't want it to spill over. So I need the all clear before I'm going to go into those areas. I mean, there's certain jurisdictions that I'm not going to touch. I mean, I, I personally am not going to do a lot in Mexico these days. I think that there's been a lot of turmoil in Mexican mining law. Some of it's been rescinded. Now there's a new president. It's uncertain how that's going to play out. Um, there's places where there's still too much overall uncertainty, like Venezuela, I wouldn't go there. But, generally speaking, I don't judge, I don't really have no-go jurisdictions, or go jurisdictions. What I like to say about the jurisdictional risk question is, jurisdictional risk comes in lots of disguises. 
So I live in Vancouver. I'm very aware of mining projects and permitting in British Columbia, my home province. It is incredibly difficult to permit a new mine in British Columbia. And for it to take five years to permit a mine, that is risk as well. Yep. It is the risk that investors will get really bored and sell your stock because they don't want to sit around for five years. That's a very real risk. So jurisdictional risk comes in lots of different colors, lots of different disguises. So there's the obvious don't go places, places that are at war, places where pol new politicians in power have outspokenly stated that they're against mining. Those are obvious. Um, but what you need to do is make sure that the people who are suggesting that an investment in a particular country works can back up, can provide example, can provide re recent examples of why it is a functional place and how they have the right understanding of that jurisdiction to make it okay. What about a jurisdiction you'd go into eyes closed? For exploration, sure. anywhere that I can get a drill permit and drill. Okay. Um, for development. So not the US. <laughs> certainly not forest service land. <laughs> um, for development, uh, it's more about the timeline for how long it would take to get a permit to actually build a mine. Very few I would never go in because that depends on the asset itself. You have to judge the, the asset versus the, the jurisdiction. Uh, jurisdictions apply discounts um, and it's all a, a risky speculative area so you're always going to have some risk. So right now there's a Mexico discount. You're talking about the juniors here and that brings me maybe to the next point. When I go around here and I'm going to start going through the booths and asking everyone annoying questions, what are the three most annoying questions I can ask them? What would you ask a company if you could only ask them three questions? I usually start by trying to determine if I give a damn about their answer. So I ask them what they've done in their career that would make me want to ask them for advice. And I ask them a related question, say, how is your experience and your prior success related to the task at hand? In other words, are you the right person for the job that you're doing? Because I want to know if I care about the answer. Uh, once I've ascertained that I care about the answer, then what I say is I make money on the discrepancy between price and value. I can see what your share price is. Explain to me what it's worth and why. They hate that question. Uh, sometimes, though, they're polite enough to give me an answer. And then the third thing I like to ask is tell me what the most important unanswered question is that you're trying to answer. In development stage companies, you need to think of them like technology companies, not asset-rich companies. And you increase the value of the asset by increasing the certainty around the outcome. You do that by answering a series of unanswered questions. And I like to ask companies, in terms of increasing the value of your assets, uh, what is the most important unanswered question that will assist the market in getting more knowledge of the real value of their project? I've been doing that for 40 years. And in about 80% of the cases, when I ask the question, the management team says, oh, I've never considered that. Uh, which is really useful. You never have to talk to that guy again. Uh, but it's an important question in the sequence of expertise, value, and outcome. So what do you do? Just, you just walk away, you say like, thank you. It, thanks for your time. <laughs> so, so one, and this is something that um, I talked about in, in, in my speech here at the end, is, is what are your plans and how do you operate from a sustainability and, and therefore economic and environmentally official perspective. I think whether you have certain ESG, if you call them that, platforms, or you're simply operating um, efficiently with respect to the environment, because that actually is something that is going to be get more funding from governments around those environments. It creates less instability around the projects. So I think it's very important right now to ask, what, what, what are your environmental and, and ESG um, principles um, technologically and with respect to your mine site? Because that's going to be more and more where capital is going to go, again, from governments and therefore from private investments. So I think economically, from an investment standpoint, that's very important. It's going to become more and more important. Um, also, what is your relationship, um, if we are looking at sort of a U.S.-centric investor, uh, what is your relationship um, as an ally uh, to the United States? You know, are, are you part of... Um, 
trade currently right now? Um, do you have a good relationship? Because if you do, then the funding that you're going to get from the U.S. on mines from your own country and collaboration is going to potentially be more. And let's face it, we need money to, to mine. Miners need money to mine. Um, and therefore, just ancillary to that, whatever the jurisdiction is around there. Um, I spoke to one silver company here, um, for example, that, that has a couple of really interesting mine sites out in Morocco. Um, historically, Silver has come from Mexico and, and Argentina and Chile, and, and these sites have tremendous support from the Moroccan government. So I look at that as a positive. That's a question I want to ask. What's your relationship to your, to your local um, and the national government where, where your mine site is? So ESG, your own economics in terms of funding and your relationship to um, the government from a local on up to national level where you're, where you're operating. The, the basics are what are the deliverables this year that's going to add value for shareholders? Not just what work are you going to do, what's going to add value for shareholders, i.e. make the share price go up. And, you know, geophysics and new water cooler is not going to do it. Sorry, geophysicists. Uh, so what are you going to do this year that's going to add value for shareholders? How much is that going to cost? How much do you have in the bank? Because even if you buy the answer to number one and you like it, and the answer to the two is less than number three, then you know they're going to have to finance which means don't buy it now. Like, even if you like it, it means wait for that financing to create that opportunity. And so, you, so there's different ways you can mix and match the answers to these three things. Other than that, it would be very company specific. Mm. With geophysics, it's actually kind of interesting because I've started caring about geophysics, but the market doesn't. Is there maybe an arbitrage opportunity where you start caring about geophysics because the market doesn't and you read into it? Can I do something with geophysics, I suppose, is what I'm asking? I'm, you know, I, I'm teasing, and there's an old joke in the business that the, the geophysicist, they, they hire him to do the survey and everything, and the geophysicist says, well, where do you want the deposit to be? Um, so there are circumstances where you hire the geophysicist and you don't tell him where your targets are. You don't give him your geology, like all the rock chip samples and all the little mm. fracture countings and all that stuff you've done. You say, no, you do your you know, IP, whatever it is, and then tell me where do you think the hot spots are? And then if you get that independently from them, and, and I'm really not trying to be mean to geophysicists, but it's, unless you're doing 3D seismic, which is rarely done for metals, for good reason, um, it's not an imaging technology. You're, you're, you're poking and testing and zapping the earth and you're creating theories about what these readings mean. It's, it's not like taking a picture, sure. all right? So, so it's, it's subject to interpretation. Which is why you, you, so you, you, so you get the results and then you overlay that with what you know from what the geologists have actually done applying boot leather to the field. And if it coincides, then that gives you confidence in the geophysics. Mm. So in that circumstance, then um, that can be very exciting for me. I have bought stocks based on that, like um, Copper Mountain back in the day. It no longer exists, so I can mention the company, right? It's been taken over. But um, they, they, it was exactly like that. They were three old pits. So you knew where they were, and they, and they flew the geophysics, and they didn't give them the data, and they came up with three bullseyes that completely aligned with the old pits. And then there was a fourth anomaly, a great big sort of hulking mother anomaly underneath the other three. And that was the theory. Look, you know, we have a 100% correlation with known mineralization, and there's an identical signature at depth here. And so that's what they tested, that's where they found the growth, and, and that's really what got them going at the mine. Mm. Um, so, and as I recall, that was a win for readers back in the day. I think you're overcomplicating a little bit. You look for a big red blob, if it's there, you buy the stock. If it's not there, you don't buy the stock. No, no. <laughs> um, what, and, and by the way, it can be a false positive. I've seen one, it was very compelling, where here's the old mine, and, there's a, and it's faulted off on one side. Like, you can, you can see the fault in the rocks. Mm. So here's the mine, and here's the geophysics blob for the mine. Here's another one up here. It looks just like the mine. Mm. And if it's faulted, like the, the story, the idea is it was a big blob, and it got cut in two by the fault. Here's the old mine, and now we found with the geophysics the, the faulted off continuation, which was a nice high-grade mine. Mm. There's a beautiful theory. Uh, they tested and came up with, can I say fuck all on your show? It was basically, the, you know, the bupkis. They, they came up with nothing. So it's never a sure thing. But under the right circumstances, yeah, I, I think uh, I'm really not poo-pooing geophysics. I'm saying it is a tool, and used wisely, it can be very helpful. Look, I want to, is it a metal that I want to own, right? Which for me right now is gold. I might want to own silver speculation, but I want to invest in gold. 
um, what's your jurisdiction in your mind? Where are you? Because the first thing I want to know is where you are. And so I can you know, try and handicap the chance of some kind of government policy screwing up my investment. And the third thing I want to know about is the management team. I want to know their track record, their successes, their failures, who they are, what they've done, where they've come from, and, and who can I talk to in this world, which is a very closed world, to get some honest feedback on the management team because I'm not investing in a company unless I trust the management team. How are you still in business? That's the number one That's the number one question. So, so the thing about the gold market that's interesting with the stocks is that if you take the stock index, pick GDX, whatever you want, divide it in the gold price, it's not really moved. It hasn't really moved. And so the gold price is at all time highs and the stocks haven't moved, all right? So what you want to do if you're coming into this market is don't be dazzled by story and don't be dazzled by hope and upside because I was here, I mean, I think I'm significantly older than you. I was here like a long time ago and it was the same story, right? And so a lot of these companies uh, slowly run out of money and don't let that be your money. So the thing to do is to do your homework and to watch what happens to these stocks, right? Like. What happens is, is that at some point, institutional money is going to come into this business and you're going to see them go like this and start moving. And so you want to have your list in advance. You want to have your list ready to go and you want to be patient and you want to watch. Now, the reason I brought up Berkshire Hathaway is because if you keep an eye on these people, which I, I don't own the stock, but I think it's wise to keep an eye on a company that large. The reason they have 18 to 20 percent of the money in T-bills and in cash is because they said they've had a hard time finding things to buy that they think they can make a huge profit on, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's the attitude you need to have. You need to walk around this thing and you need to say, I'm having a hard time finding something that I think is a guarantee, okay? Mm -hmm. But I'm going to be doing my homework and I'm going to be sitting in cash and T-bills ready to go, yeah. okay? So if the gold price went up and none of the companies geared up, that's a bad sign, mm -hmm. right? So that means that the higher gold price isn't going to save them, yeah. right? So it's going to be people coming into the market. And so what you want to do is you want to do your homework now, and then you want to watch the charts. Mm. Because the charts will tell you. I mean, people can tell you anything about what they hope to do in the future, but the chart tells you when the stock is going to go higher and when it's going to go a lot higher, okay? You can, it's very easy. We do this in my newsletter. We watch charts and we say we can know nothing about the company and tell you if it's going to go higher or lower. It's really pretty, it's, it's not technical at all. I mean, you can actually do it on Yahoo Finance. It's not very hard. Statistically, a stock is going to go higher. It behaves a certain way. And when I was a kid, I asked, why do stocks go higher? And the guy told me because there's more buyers than sellers. Hmm. All right. And so in, the, in this market right now, it doesn't matter what you learn at the company's booth. If there's not more buyers than sellers, it ain't going anywhere. And in fact, if the company needs to issue more stock, to keep the lights on, it's going to go down, you know, e even if things are any better. So, you know, we're at all-time high gold price and, you know, be wise with your money. I mean, it's hard to make money, right? It's hard to, to make money and to have savings and to invest in something. It's very, very difficult. And so you don't want to be cavalier when it comes to that. You want to say, like, I'll just see what happens. You know, people, people always tell me, oh, it's just play money. It's like, well, there is no play money. You know, I mean, I mean I'm, a, I'm a person that doesn't have, like, a job. You know, I don't have, like, a whatever, I don't have somebody who gives me money every two weeks for coming to an office every day. So, I mean, there is no play money. You know, if I, if I am frivolous with the money, I gotta go find some more of it. And it's not exactly always easy. So that's how I think about this, you know, philosophically. And I, and I think people, what they want is a ticker symbol, but it, it doesn't really work that way. Well, first of all, it's important to understand that, that Rick, who puts on this conference, Rick Rule, personally signs off on every company that's here. That, that to me is already checks the boxes for me because in this industry it's as much who you know as what you know and Rick knows more than anyone and knows more people than anyone and so to have his stamp of approval is first and foremost. I mean for me the first thing is, is where it's located um, because there's always that risk of nationalization if you were in a place that carries extra risk in terms of geopolitically. So. Where is its location would be number one. Whether it's a, a producer or, or a major player or a minor or exploratory, that's another thing I'd want to know because if I had one place to put my money and only one, it would be in that sector, would be in a major producer. Yet you can make more money exponentially so if you pick the right junior or the right exploration stock. And that's why having Rick 
sign off on these and 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 talk about the property and talk about you know he he likes to say serially successful people he likes to work with people who've had a great track record so probably would be location track record of the of the people behind the project and also the is it a producer is it a major a major producer a minor or an exploration and i think at this stage of the game most of my money would be in the majors with a little bit a little bit more speculative on the smaller companies but feeling comfortable that rick signed off on him i think he'd have a fighting chance on whoever you pick here so one question i would ask is the balance sheet i want to know how much cash they have and how long that is going to last them so and and it's important it's not just the amount of cash they have but it's what we call their runway to fulfill their plan so if they've got a drilling budget for the next uh, nine months and they've got a feasibility to do after that do they have enough mo money for at least an 18 months runway without having to raise money that to me is is critical um, another question to always ask is how many warrants are out and at what price people often ignore that I think we've ignored it for the last 10 years because not many stocks have gone up enough to exercise warrants. Mm. But now it's an important point. If, if you've got a company with, let's say, as much as 20% of their stock uh, uh, in, in, in warrants, and the warrants are in the money, there's a high, a high risk for people exercise the warrants and sell the stock. Mm. So that's always something to look at. And then the third thing, to me the most important thing, it's not a question. But the most important thing I look at when I go to booths is just management. And, you know, if you're talking to someone for 10 minutes, that's really not enough time to get a good sense of a person. But get a sense of does the person tell the truth? Um, uh, do they tell you the downside? I always ask questions like, what is it that keeps you awake at night? What could go wrong with your company? When I say, when I ask someone, what is the biggest risk in your company? And they say nothing, there is no risk. Well, I walk away, because that's idiotic, because there's a risk in everything, right? Um, so those, yeah, so maybe that's the question to ask. But, but the thing I'm really looking for with all these questions is management. And that's why I get to know all these managements. I try to spend as much time with them as I possibly can, not just interviewing one-on-one -on, -one on, the, on the latest results, but going out to dinner with them, going to mine sites, just getting to know them and seeing how they behave and how they act, critical to me, critical. So it, I would refer back to my answers on the other. Um, what I liked with, say, Keith Newmeyer of First Majestic, and they've had their share of problems and assets that haven't worked, but um, he's, he's a finance guy and he wants to be bigger. Hmm. So you want to see the pursuit of scale, which brings me back, as I say, to the other question. That doesn't mean mindless purchases, and some might say, you know, Jared Canyon didn't turn out quite as planned, and they've, had, they've got their challenges on that. Um, but good quality, a good geologist, uh, and an intent to grow. Uh, so I like to see the greybeards that have picked up the scars in the mining space uh, with long track records, uh, and then somebody with an, uh, enough youth and vigor that wants to scale. So you want that M&A feel. Uh, and I would also start on the upper half of the size size as well, for those same reasons. Well, usually, I mean, uh, I don't talk to any company that I don't know already. Hmm. So I usually don't talk to anybody uh, until, like, I'm coming here. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, the way I do it is more proactive. Okay. I'm not wandering around and looking at brochures. Huh. So um, I would have done my work prior and already picked the companies, and I would be asking them more detailed questions because I've already done my homework. Uh, but I'm not going to be asking where you are, uh, what kind of deposit uh, that you're looking for, you know, what's your share structure, how many warrants do you have outstanding. Those are the sort of questions you might ask somebody that you know nothing about. And I don't like to come in knowing nothing. Okay, if, when you know that, though, go into your head. You can only ask them three things. What do you ask them? Well, it, it's complicated because it depends on the work I've done. So if, if the work is that the metallurgy is complicated... I will dig into the details on the metallurgy. If the permitting is the issue, I'll be asking about social license to operate, but digging deeper onto a couple of thematics rather than asking them high-level questions, because the high-level questions I could do myself. I don't need to ask them. Uh, what I want to do is ask the questions I can't extract through their technical reports or through their presentations. Given I'm a geologist, my first question is going to be, 
what is it you're looking for? How will you know if you've got it, found it? And more importantly, how do you know when to quit? The problem with a lot of these companies, not just here, but you know, that's exploration, is they don't know when to quit. So you need to know what you're looking for. You need to know, ask them, what's it going to cost to get to this decision point? What's it going to cost to build it if you find something worthwhile? And how are you going to fund that at a continually higher price, share price? Okay. Those are more than three questions. What was it? Three oh, <laughs> what are you, so what are you looking for? Yeah. What, how do you know if you're correct in your assessment, mm. in your model? And at what point do you quit? Yeah. You know, what, what's it going to cost to build this thing? Three questions. Uh, good question. Um, first would be, how much do you have in the bank and when are you raising next? Second would be, what are the catalysts or the catalysts or multiple catalysts that are in the calendar before you are raising next and what would success look like for those specific catalysts? And third, this is a bit of a tricky one and will often trip up management teams, but you know, your share price is X. What do you think fair value of the company is at, at, at its current stage? And how, as an investor, should I think about what fair value is? Um, and I think those would be, if I could only ask three, those would be my top three questions. First one is I'd ask, you know, management, what's your track record? What have you done in the past? Um, obviously, you, you can get new guys coming through, and this is their first rodeo, and they happen to pull it off. But, you know, most of the people that are worth backing have had success in the past. So I'd make sure the team that you're investing in is, you know, has pedigree and knows what they're doing. Um, I would ask, I'd be very aware of the cash, you know, how much capital they have mm. at the moment. Are they, are they capitalized or are they going to need to raise a whole bunch of money or are they going to be able to raise the money to execute on what they want to do without diluting you as a shareholder? You know, you can have technical successes and, you know, you can make a new discovery, but equity doesn't make a dollar. So you need to really make sure that, you know, you're investing in a company that's going to be able to pull off what they want to do uh, and to the benefit of shareholders. And, and as a sort of side qu question to that, I would make sure that you're, you know, ideally you're, the management teams you're backing have skin in the game and real skin in the game, not just, you know, cheapo shares and, you know, gifted themselves equity in the company. Um, so that would be number two. And then number three, I mean, you really want to understand the, the project itself that you're investing in at the junior level. Does it have geological merit? I mean, that does take a little bit of expertise to, to figure that last one out. It's, it's, it's hard as a, as a lay person trying to figure out whether a project has technical merit or not. I mean, that's where you know, guys like us, I know you're gonna be interviewing Brent Cook, you know, geologists, technical people that have been in the field that know what they're doing. Um, they're probably the best ones to answer that question for you. How much money have you put into your own stock? And it isn't the dollar amount, it's the percent of your net worth that you've put into your own stock. If you haven't bought your own stock in a meaningful way, why should I? That's question number one. Question number two is, what did the companies do that you ran previously and that, and that were under your tenure? Did you create shareholder value? If you did not, you know what, what, what tells me that you're gonna create shareholder value now? If you did, hey, I'm gonna take the next step and keep looking. And then the third thing is, where is it at? It's gotta be in a pro mining jurisdiction. You can't move your deposit, you can't move your exploration program. And so it's gotta be in a, in a, in a area that has, uh, uh, you know, respects property rights and that sort of thing. You work for an issuer right now, so it might be tougher for you to answer. But what if I wanted to talk to all the companies here and judge and basically give a yes or a no answer as to, am I buying it or not? But I could only ask them three questions. What three questions should I ask them? Ah, that's pretty interesting. Okay, so um, I think I would ask, I would ask a question that helps me understand whether they have access to money. So do they have it in the bank? Do they have a plan for how they're going to access the money, do, right? Like, will they be able to be active? Because if you can't do anything, your share price isn't gonna go anywhere. So do they have capital or access to capital? Then what is the detailed plan for what they're gonna do with that capital? And how is that plan likely to create new shareholder value? Mm. And it's funny, people used to ask me a lot, like, if I had one question to ask, I'm like, the question to ask is, what is your detailed plan over the next 12 months to create new value for shareholders? And I, I say that because it pulls in, that question pulls in everything. 
It pulls in, what's your geologic premise? What are you going to do about, how are you going to test that premise? How much are those drill holes going to cost? Do you have access to the money? If it doesn't work, what's your plan B? It's, and a good management team will have that detailed plan. They will have considered all of those questions and it will be part of their vision for the next 12 months. They always say it comes down to people and it does, but it's very hard to judge a person. Even if you get to meet them in person at a conference, it's still hard to really know. So my test of a person initially is, can they tell me a detailed plan for how they plan to create new shareholder value in the next 12 months? You gotta be careful, because I might ask you those questions tomorrow. Okay, sounds good.